And that common thread was a lot on sanctification, how we as Christians grow in our faith. And um, so I'll go ahead and read uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism's definition of sanctification. And it is, sanctification is the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. So yeah, you could spend years talking about, preaching about uh, sanctification. And that whole phrase right there. Um, but, and, and, th and that's all really good, but sanctification means growth, means change. And that's kind of the drawback that gives me a little bit of anxiety today is that when I start talking about growth and change, change often or at best is uncomfortable. And oftentimes it's painful. And so I'm going to be asking you guys to, uh, or I'm going to be encouraging people, everybody to, to grow and change. And that can be uncomfortable like what I said. So, I mean, there is a reason why God uses the analogy of a refining fire to purify metal as to purify his people. And you can find verses uh, that say just exactly that on, in Zechariah 13.9 and 1 Peter 1.7. So the goal is to, of sanctification is to shed ourselves, the sinful part of us, and to grow more, to be more Christ-like and that means having to give up stuff, stuff that we like. <laughs> so I do have a real concern that some of you or many of you could take offense to some of the things I say today. And so in that case, I, I just ask that you guys would show me some grace and some mercy. Um, and... If you want to talk to me after the sermon, I'd be more than happy to, to continue the discussion. So uh, this sermon, the subject is about a walk that took me almost to my own embarrassment five or six years to try to figure out. Um, so it's a, uh, something that's deeply personal to me, and I'm going to walk through the subject of this sermon which is good with a capital G, um, in almost how my own personal discovery and studying has went. So some of it starts to get a little bit meandering because there's lots of facets to, to this point. But, uh, but if you stay with me, I think, uh, I think it'll be a come to a good ending here. Um, so basically, what we're looking for is that we as Christians, we... we uh, God has done so much, so much for us, right? Saved us, uh, blesses us every day. And, and so it's a, a common desire for us as Christians to want to do something good or do good works to uh, at least show our gratitude. Uh, there's other reasons that, that we can try to do good things that are more selfish, uh, like trying to get God to notice us, or maybe if we do this good thing, then we can get, uh, then God will bless us in certain ways, or if we do this bad thing, then oh no, God's going to punish us for that, um, which, which I'll talk about later in the sermon. But, uh, but goodness has a lot of times become a lot like truth, or more prevalent in our, in our uh, society, in our culture, than, or it's more relative like truth. It's in the eye of the beholder. And so I really appreciate Emmett's sermon from last uh, Sunday about truth because it fits very well with the subject I want to talk about today, which is goodness, where so much in our society, truth becomes, well, I'm going to discover my own truth, my personal truth. And no, truth comes from God. And goodness is even more that way where where we say, oh, this is good. This is a good thing to do. And, well, is it really? And that was the question that I struggled with for years. Well, what is truly good? The good with a capital G. What can I do that would be good? An actual one good work, right? And I had a hard time defining that. Um, 
So, but we can start out first with, is goodness or righteousness really worth pursuing? And, and that actually is a question that should at least be shortly addressed. Um, because you can get into, well, I guess it's fairly obvious to us as Christians, we say, yeah, you need to. But there are some in the Christian circles uh, who would say, if I were attempt, or I have Christ's righteousness as a Christian, so if I were to attempt to do good works, would that only be attempts to improve the righteousness of Christ and in effect begin to nullify the fullness of Christ's work on the cross? And that's kind of an interesting statement there, right? That makes sense. And there is, a, there is some truth to it. But then a lot of times people who are saying this use this as an excuse to not pursue doing good works, uh, to be able to live their life however they want and, and keep their little sins and not feel guilty about them. And I think that the Bible is uh, uh, very clear that that is not the way that we should live, that God is very interested in doing good works in his people being righteous. And uh, so a couple of proofs from the Bible itself that state exactly that is that we have Psalms 34, while David was actually hiding from Saul in mountain caves. Um, and he said, turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. Then you have Matthew 5 on the Sermon of the Mount with the Beatitudes where Jesus is talking. And he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And then a verse that Emmett used last week that I thought was great, and it speaks directly to uh, those Christians who would use uh, uh, the idea of that if I try to do righteous works, then that would be diminishing Christ's work on the cross. Um, and that is 1 John 2, 4, where if someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and, the, and is not living the truth. So I think that we can determine that God is very interested in Christians, in his people, doing good works. The question just is, well, what is a good work? Um, I guess one more thing that I can talk about is kind of outside of the Bible. I'm an engineer, so I think very logically. And uh, C.S. Lewis has a, uh, uh, he wrote a book, Mere Christianity, and, and I'd recommend it to anybody. It's a, I, I enjoy reading C.S. Lewis's works. Um, but in the first couple of chapters of Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis actually goes through a very logical approach on how to or on the proof that there is a creator, that God exists. And it's completely using observations in the world around us, and not using any, any scripture at that point because he's just trying to make a point that you can just see how our world is made and know that God exists. And the, ba and the main basis that he gets to is that there are certain laws of nature that exist, like gravity. And we have to obey those laws. But then there also s appears to be this second set of laws, and they're kind of the laws of morality, where we all inherently know them, even if you want to deny them and say, well, morality doesn't exist or morality is uh, uh, relative to the person. But the fact of the matter still is, or still is that when you're wronged in some way, you feel wronged. And the fact that you feel wronged, that means that there must be a right and a wrong, that right and wrong must exist. And so a quote from uh, that book is that, uh, now from this bit of evidence, we can conclude that this being with capital B behind the universe is intensely interested in right conduct, in fair play, unselfishness, courage, good faith, honesty, and truthfulness. Because those are all universal truths that even if you were to deny that morality exists, you still behave as if it does. Just like tr 
uh, truth with a capital T if you were to say, well, my truth is just what I experience. Um, you still uh, live your life as if some things are true. So, and then one other item is that the sheer fact that God gave us commandments, the Ten Commandments, uh, shows that he wants us to be set apart and there is a right and a wrong and he's interested in us doing right. So now we can actually get to the scripture that is the basis of the sermon after I've kind of had a long introduction, but no coughs from my wife, so that's a, that's a positive thing. Um, and the scripture from this for the sermon is Mark 10, 17 through 27. And it's the story of the rich man who came to Jesus um, and was asking what more could he do. And so I'll start in verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said, uh, amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? I'm going to actually leave the last verse, uh, the passage, till later in the sermon. Um, but since most of us are, are Christians who've been Christians for a little while, we've, we're familiar with this, with this passage in the Bible, right? Um, we're uh, not necessarily surprised by this interaction of this man and Jesus. And we know the answer to the question that the disciples ask, then who can be saved? Um, and a lot of times this passage is, is used in sermons to talk about the hazards of depending on wealth instead of Jesus or that, uh, that Christ is the only way to be saved. Um, and I'm going to uh, take a little bit of a different approach than, than those normal sermons that are, that are based off of this uh, passage here. And the main points that I want to make is that this guy was very sincere in his devotion. He was, he followed all the rules, right? He tried to follow all the rules, tried to do really good things and, and not do bad things. Um, and he had a clear conscience about it. I mean, he's coming up to a great teacher and he says, hey, I'm doing all this, you know, what more can I do because I'm doing all of this? And you can almost read between the lines where he's like, I still don't feel like I'm doing enough. And so by all appearances, outward appearances at least, he was the model Jew or in today's uh, world, the model Christian or the equivalent of a model Christian. And then we kind of get blindsided and Jesus essentially says, that's not enough. And you can tell by the disciples' reaction, they're kind of blown away by it too. This guy who does everything right and he still kind of gets told, no, that's not enough. You need to do more. And so if he can do all of that, then, then who can be accepted? Who can do enough? Who can do even just one thing right? And uh, so I'll even go to Matthew 7 here, uh, where it's kind of a scary passage, very scary for, for even us as Christians, where in verse 21, it says, not everyone, this is Jesus talking again, and he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, 
but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Drive out demons? Or, or did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil, deal, you evil doers. So Jesus himself is even saying, well, there's some people who are going to cry out to me, Lord, Lord. And I'm going to tell them away from me instead. Of, and they even are uh, doing great works, right? Performing miracles, driving out demons in Jesus' name. And Jesus is saying, instead of well done, good job, he's saying, get away from me. I didn't know you. I never knew you. I certainly cry, Lord, Lord, to my God and my Savior. And I haven't done anything like perform miracles or or at least none that I'm aware of. I mean, there might be some, that <laughs> but nothing that I'm, that I'm aware of. And so that's, that's scary for us as Christians because we do call God our Lord and Savior. So I, to kind of understand this, I guess there's a, there's a certain point where both of these passages, you could say, well, the people who are crying, Lord, Lord, they weren't Christians. They didn't really truly believe, didn't have a personal relationship with, with Jesus. This rich man in the Bible passage that the, is the subject of the sermon, same thing. And, and I would agree with that. That's true. But I would also extend that and say, well, there, are, there is a certain point where these things that this, this rich man is doing or that people are doing in, in Matthew 7, where they're, com they're even performing miracles and driving out demons, that that can be extrapolated to us as Christians as well. And to understand that more, you have to kind of go through... Uh, what is sin? And sure, in, in Christian circles, we talk about sin as the, any acts that we commit that, uh, that separates us or damages our relationship with God. And um, yeah, that's, that's part of it. But there's another side of sin. And, and here I'm going to start to get close to... Uh, uh, I was raised in a Lutheran church, so I'm going to start to get pretty close to the uh, philosophy of total depravity out of uh, uh, Calvinism, and I know that uh, Lon Kennedy's ears are probably tingling right now, because, <laughs> uh, yeah, he wasn't uh, someone who agreed with Calvinistic uh, points of view, but, uh, but there is this other side of sin that entered the world when that first sin was committed. And when that, uh, when that first sin was committed, it basically tainted the rest of the creation. And so what we have is that human nature turned to where it is inherently, inherently leaning away from God instead of towards Him now. It caused death and disease and suffering to enter the world where it wasn't in the world prior. And it's the primary problem that God has yet to resolve in the end days. It's the reason why we as Christians, we are redeemed and we're saved, but despite our best efforts, we still sin because we're still in this universe, we're still in this world, and we're still corrupted. Our flesh is still corrupted by sin. So... Just like one drop of a potent poison that gets dropped into a, a bucket of good water, the whole, wa the whole bucket's now poison, and any drink would kill you. That's what sin did on that first committing of the sinful act. Our world is, is uh, corrupted now, every part of it. So, um, I'm not... I don't see what time it is, but I'm not really a fan of uh, 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 the TV show Friends, but there is a, a pretty good analogy of the point that I'm trying to get across here or that I'm walking up to is that there was one episode of Friends where uh, one character and another character for that whole entire episode, one character says, well, you can do good things. 
And the other character says, well, no, you're, you'll be selfish. Every, everything that you do when you try to do a good thing, there's selfishness tied to it. You can't do a selfless act, basically. And so the whole entire argument, there's this back and forth of what, where one character is trying to do a truly selfless act and keeps getting pointed out, nope, you're not, that's not selfless because you feel good about that. That's not selfless because uh, you're getting recognition for this, this work. And the episode actually ends where uh, the character who is trying to do a selfless act, she doesn't like PBS at all, has some, I don't even remember what the, the bad experience with PBS was. But the other character was uh, working as a struggling actor, and so he, was, he had gotten a job answering phones for PBS donations. And so... She calls in and donates money to PBS, thinking, I hate PBS. I don't like it at all. I'm actually feeling bad that I'm doing this. That's, that's a selfless act, right? Well, then she calls in, and, she, and her dollar amount happens to actually break the amount for the record of, uh, for donations. And her friend actually answered the phone and took the donation. So he gets recognized on national television, and she says, oh, yes, great. No, I feel great about this, right? <laughs> and so then she fails to do that selfless act. And, and I would even argue to say, even if the selfless act went exactly how she had planned, she would have the, um, the I told you so, the gotcha to her friend, the, that feeling of uh, I'm right and you're wrong. I just did a selfless act. But then that by itself then... Uh, makes it selfish and, um, and appeals to her pride. So we'll go into a couple of, uh, um, or I guess we'll go to the, the passage again about the rich man where uh, the rich man comes to Jesus and Jesus doesn't actually call him out directly for his attempts at righteousness. And instead, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And that tells me that uh, this man actually had really good motivations. He was sincere on what he did, but the man was still selfish uh, in his motives behind his actions. And his selfishness was pointed out by Jesus in asking him to sell all of his possessions. So... But the fact that this guy, this rich man, was really sincere and really, truly wanted to do better, wanted to do more for God, right? Um, that's almost the worst part. Because all of us want to do better, right? We want to we wanna work hard. We all have this mental list, whether we, whether we want to admit it or not. I mean, I have it as well. Uh, we have this mental list of, things that we do to please God. We come to church today. We, we uh, tithe. We give, to, we give of our time. We volunteer, all that kind of stuff. And, and those are mental lists of, oh, these are good things. These are things that I do for God. And uh, they're in attempts to get God to notice us, to, but basically to be good or do what's right. And the reality is that so much of that is actually sinful. We have pride. We, we want a sense of recognition, uh, earning favors with God. And so um, some Bible verses that I skipped um, for that kind of show this is that we have Isaiah 64 starting in verse 6. The book of Isaiah says, All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Paul in Romans 3, um, bringing together a couple of other verses from Isaiah and Psalms, uh, says in verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. So again, that is that sinful corruption that goes with all of our actions. 
trying to do good. So yeah, the here's where I get a little bit uh, nervous because if you take this to where it's going, then in our own effort, in our own uh, desires, when we do things that we think are good, when we think are right, when everybody around us would say, hey, you're doing a good job here, you're doing good work here, such as, uh, like I said, giving to the poor, coming to church, volunteering for a community, a good, a good uh, cause, um, providing a meal for someone who is sick, even witnessing the gospel to someone or preaching a sermon like I'm up here today. If that's within m our own desire, our own efforts, it's sinful. It's wrong. It doesn't seem that way, but it is. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't use sinful acts for his purposes. I mean, just take the story of Joseph in Egypt as a great example for that. There was a whole bunch of bad, sinful things that happened to Joseph, and in the end, Joseph could see God's work in it and say, hey, what, what was meant for wrong, what was meant for evil, uh, God used for good and brought about the, the rescue of his people. Of, uh, at that time, it was just the family there, but... God was able to fulfill his promise to continue to bless uh, Abraham's descendants through that. So I guess nobody walked out. That's a good sign. <laughs> um, but the point that I'm really trying to get at, it, and, and it's the point that I was stuck on for probably years, is that if I'm I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I love God, I know God loves me. I want to do something to show God how much I love him, how much I appreciate what he's done for me. But what can I do when I know that if I, if I um, decide to do something good here or there that I think is really good, that I know everybody else would agree with me if I asked them if, if, it, was, if it would be good for me to do this, that I would know in my heart that I had pride or that I was uh, appreciating that, uh, the recognition for doing that work, and in that I was sinning, but I was trying to figure out what could I actually do that was 100% good, no, uh, uh, none of that poison of sin corrupting just a little bit of it, right? Because there's not just a little bit of poison. It's either poisonous or it's not. There's not a little bit of sin, it's either sinful or not. So, the Apostle Paul, going back to him, he's kind of a hero of the faith, right? But uh, just kind of a side note, don't cough, Erica, but uh, just thought about it, is that there is no heroes of the faith that are actually always that much of a hero. Um, and Paul comes pretty close, but, but still, uh, he does have his mistakes. Um, but this is not one of those. But he was kind of the Hebrew's Hebrew or uh, Christian's Christian, right? He achieved more as a Jew than most did in their lifetime. And then when he was converted, he did more as a Christian than most Christians do in their lifetime. And so in Philippians 3, he writes, though, starting in verse 4, If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. So he's admitting right there that he's got, he's done everything right. But in verse 7 he says, but whatever were the gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having the righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So that's, that's interesting. We're talking about what can we do, what good things, what acts can we do, to, uh, 
to be righteous, to do good things. And Paul says righteousness comes by faith, not by what we do, by faith in God. So that just changes everything completely, right? <laughs> and, and I do want to hit a couple of things just to, Paul does say righteousness of my own that comes from the law. But in Romans, Paul talks about where the law doesn't actually lead to righteousness. It can only point out the sins that we have. So the law itself can be good and is perfect, but it can't save us. It can't bring righteousness. So he's not meaning that you can become righteous by following the law. He's just meaning if you try to gain righteousness by the law, that's, he doesn't see that at all. As, at all. The point is the righteousness that comes from God through faith is what he's focused on. So it's so obvious to a new believer, right, is that you say, oh, I'm, I'm a sinner. I can do no good in the sight of God. I need God's, uh, or I need God to save me from my sin because what I deserve is eternity in hell for everything that I've done. And uh, I need God to save me from that because I can't do it on my own. But we forget as Christians that we also need God's grace and faith in God to have ongoing right righteousness through sanctification. So yeah, that's the, that's the part that uh, I'm almost a little embarrassed by because <laughs> it's so obvious, right, when you get to it. But we get, I would get so stuck on, I want to do something good that I would forget that what I need to do is just have faith. So that is just really a pivotal point in my understanding of what is righteousness, that I don't have to be, even as a Christian, focused on what I'm doing day to day. I should just focus on God. Martin Luther, again, going back to uh, being raised in a Lutheran church, uh, uh, but he was the father, father of the Protestant Reformation, and he actually got stuck on this, which is even more embarrassing, being raised Lutheran and then still missing this point for so many years in my Christian walk. Uh, but one of the really pivotal points for him was that same realization, is that he lived years as a priest, and he was extremely disturbed by the fact that no matter how good he tried to be, he could never be good enough to please God in his own mind because he would always see sin everywhere. He would, he would actually annoy other priests because he'd spend so much time in confessional, right? <laughs> oh, here comes Martin, <laughs> right? I'm going to be here for an hour. Um, but uh, he came across Romans 117, and he had a realization of an interpretation that up until that point had been lost from the early days of, uh, of the Christian faith. Is that, and Romans 117 is, for the gospel, or for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And he said, this is where my righteousness is going to come from. It's by faith. And then you, of course, have Abram, who was later named Abraham. He was declared righteous even before the law was given. And Hebrews, the book of Hebrews talks about that, is that you, uh, Abraham, at the time, there was no right or wrong that God had at least revealed at, uh, as far as like the, the law, the Ten Commandments. And so Genesis 15, 6, Abram believed the Lord and he was credited, credited it to him as righteousness. So Jesus rarely commended people on their own actions. Um, but when he did... It was almost always faith-based. And so for a couple of examples where Jesus actually pointed out to his disciples and said, hey, look at this, right? Wouldn't you like to be remembered for all eternity as somebody who, who Jesus said, hey, 
check this out. Check what happened out here, right? So uh, two examples of that are the um, centurion who had a sick servant in Luke 7, and then also uh, the poor widow in Mark 12. And I'll let you guys look those up um, on your own time. But the main point is that faith, acts of faith, is what actually got Jesus' attention. So if, we're, if we wish to be considered good, we need to know that when we seek and grow closer to him in faith and seek and grow closer to Jesus, to God in faith, that's when we can be considered good. And then in the seeking, we can have less of us and more of him, have his work work through us. And when he works through us, when God's work is being done, there is no sin attached to it, right? Because God has no sin attached to him. So the last verse of our passage is, uh, of course, the most important. Verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. So in conclusion, um, kind of on request from Pastor Mark, but it, it does fit very well. Uh, A.W. Tozer's book, The Pursuit of God, summarizes this whole sermon in just a few sentences, um, which would have been the shortcut to all of this. But it took me years. You guys can... Spend 30 minutes, right? <laughs> um, so in Tozer's book, faith is the least self-regarding of the virtues. It is by its very nature scarcely conscious of its own existence. Like the eye, which sees everything in front of it but never sees itself, faith is occupied with the object upon which is rests and pays no attention to itself at all. While we were looking at God, we did not, or we do not see ourselves, blessed riddance. The man who is struggling to purify himself and has had nothing but repeated failures will experience real relief when he stops tinkering with his soul and looks always to the perfect one. While he looks at Christ, the very things that he's been so long trying to do will be getting done with him. It will be God working in him to will and to do. And then faith is not in itself a meritous act. The merit is in the one toward whom it is directed. Faith is a redirecting of our sight, a getting out of focus of our own vision and getting into focus God. Sin has twisted our vision inward and made it self-regarding. Unbelief has put self where God should be and is perilously close to the sin of Lucifer who said, I will set my throne above the throne of God. Faith looks out instead of in, and the whole life falls into line. So the beginning premise of this whole sermon was flawed from the start, right? What can I do to be good? What, what actual act can I commit that would be a good act? And that's all focused inward and self. What can I do? What can I do? And what we really should be focused on is outward to God and in our walk to faith. And so instead of what can I do, we should be asking, what can God do through me? And in doing so, we can begin to see what God sees and feel what God feels. May my heart break for what breaks yours, Lord. And allowing to God to do his will through us is where we can, through faith, receive a well done. And, you know, it's kind of ironic, or at least I thought it was ironic when I first uh, realized it, but it's not that ironic, is that we've been tiptoeing the line of the gospel the whole way, right? I mean, even the stories that we've been using out of the Bible have been stories that pastors use to talk about uh, saving faith, about Christ's redemption. And what we do is that faith alone is what we need to be saved. But I've used that same situation for how, what do we do to be sanctified? 
And so, yeah, I'll repeat what I said earlier, is that we receive God's grace through faith for forgiveness of our sins. But so often we forget we must also receive God's grace through faith to do God's will in our lives. God's grace isn't just for salvation, but for sanctification as well. So the work of God, or the work of God's free grace, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. Again, the definition of sanctification there. So in conclusion, when we are seeking God and allowing Him it, through faith to work through us. It's not sinful, but instead it's a good work to come to church this morning, to tithe, to provide a meal for someone who is sick or visit people in prison, to witness the gospel or even stand up here and uh, give a sermon. Because through God's work, there is no sin.